Uh, Rod Oram has been in New Zealand since uh, 1997 and in that time has established a huge reputation uh, as a kind of journalist, uh, a communicator, commentator um, and, a kind of, and a sort of futurist uh, thinker who gathers together all sorts of strands of um, political, social and economic life and creative life in this country and um, uh, offers extraordinary insights to that. He's also, uh, I can say, a, a very uh, fine and active Antarctic athlete. Um, I'd like to ask Rod to come to the stage and uh, make pre presentation. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato, good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, thank you very much for that introduction, Pip. I think I'd better explain briefly about Antarctica. Um, uh, Pip and I ran into each other at Scott Base, as one does. Um, he was doing the historic thing, the huts and all that restoration, which is fabulous. And um, it was a marvelous uh, week I had, and I think perhaps about a week or 10 days, slightly overlapping with me that Pip had um, in early December. And um, I could talk a lot about Antarctica, and I'm starting to write a lot about it. I think it's incredibly important to the world and to us. But I will make one very brief connection uh, with you all, and actually with Racine. Um, Scott Base is so tasteful. It's all painted externally in this color Chelsea cucumber green uh, of Racine's. And it has an extraordinary effect, I think. Um, and it's such a startling juxtaposition to the military industrial complex over the hill at McMurdo that the Americans run, that I think um, Scott Base and Chelsea Cucumber Green are quite emblematic about what we are about um, in New Zealand. Oh, the athletic bit was I borrowed a mountain bike and cycled over to McMurdo one afternoon. It was a short distance, don't worry, this wasn't very athletic. Um, the, um, it's a great pleasure to be back. When I was here with you last four years ago, uh, we thought in New Zealand and the world we were sort of coming out of the global financial crisis. Um, the uh, full brunt of the Christchurch earthquakes had been felt, but there was a lot more to come. Um, and um, we had some high hopes about how our economy might develop, um, but how uh, our, our urban forms might develop. And so to be able to come back today to talk about New Zealand's economy, uh, and urban form and the role of you architects um, very much builds on that from four years ago. So I will be making uh, some um, judgments um, and some assessments about how we're progressing and what more we need to do. The more romantic title of this um, is a strange term um, which will become apparent where it comes from in due course about conditioning minds. Don't worry, that's not brainwashing or even painting them in Chelsea Cucumber Green. And um, so, uh, but that kind of developed as a theme as I was working on this. So I'll offer a bit of diagnosis about uh, what's going on with the New Zealand economy in a global context. Um, then I'll offer one part of the cure, both for us in New Zealand and the world. But then I want to apply um, those thoughts to um, our rural life and economy and um, offer one brief example of uh, very important architecture in that and suggest another. And then I want to move on to um, urban forms. We're a very strange country because we largely, and people, because we largely define ourselves by our rural and wild parts, and yet we are more urbanized as a population than France, the French or Germans, but we don't, still don't think that way. So there's some work to do. So, as um, the world turns, uh, those are all our trading partners um, and their forecasts, which are motoring along quite well. But there's, we're not free of the GFC. Um, the great danger now is stagnation and deflation. Um, about 1.4 billion people live in the world in countries uh, where prices are falling, which is economically extremely dangerous. Um, so there's an awful lot more adjustment to come. And if we aren't adjusting, um, then uh, we are doubling our danger. So, uh, very varied pattern. US is probably the best of all those countries. Um, Australia has an extraordinary hangover um, of a commodity nature. Um, and, um, but yet, through all that, there are still plenty of opportunities for us in, in New Zealand. But this is what's happening. Um, our growth is very much driven by a handful of factors, such as um, milk and log exports, uh, the rebuild of Christchurch, and quite a bit of consumer spending and some business investment. 
But what's happening is our growth rate peaked last year um, and um, uh, probably around about the middle, middle of last calendar year. And so in the year to March this year, it'll be about 3.5%. Um, but then it falls off back to our long-term uh, rate of just over 2%. Um, and that's the real worry about why there isn't momentum, why we are so constrained. In a sense, the theme's very familiar one about um, simplification of the economy, um, about um, our dependence on those lightly processed or hardly processed commodities. Um, so um, dairy is our largest exports, but whole milk powder, an unremitting um, commodity, is 80% of that, and China is our largest customer. Now, here's the impact of this. This is uh, work from the World Economic Forum, and it seeks to work out uh, what, how countries create value. So it's a scale of one to seven, um, and uh, crunching a lot of data. So one is about low-cost natural resources. Um, think of milk or iron ore. Uh, or coal, and the other end is unique products and processes. Now, it seems as though we do quite well because we score 3.8, sort of halfway along. But in fact, that's only 36th in the world. So the fact in, t in GDP terms we're about 24th, that's a real triumph of efficiency and hard work. But the point is then how you capture that value. So second part of this is the value chain. So if you're a very simple economy, you basically dig something up and ship it. Um, and um, at the other end, you're involved all the way down the value chain, involved with the final customers and after in terms of service and all the rest. And so again, strangely, same score, 3.8. But now we're 58th in the world. So this it kind of explains why um, our economy struggles so much. The only consolation this, I'm sorry, Libby, is that Australia ranks below us on both scores. I can discuss that later if you like. Um, we do know quite a lot about this, but we're doing very little about it. So this is a great report from um, the Productivity Commission last year that they commissioned from the OECD. So theoretically, if you look at our laws and our systems, we should have a pretty big GDP per capita, higher than the OECD average, but it's actually lower. So there's a gap of about 30% there. And the uh, Productivity Commission and the OECD say this is about our international con connectivity. But that's not about the internet or about how many uh, lie flat business class beds there are out of Auckland every night. Um, it's about value chains. It's about how we create value in the world and then capture it. And we are still got an enormously long way to go on that. And unfortunately, the government doesn't think about this at all. So for example, looping this back to your work, uh, recently Nick Smith piled up as many um, council plans as he could and said this is 80,000 pages of RMA, what a complete nonsense this is, what a fantastically ineffective system this is. But nobody asked him the counterfactual. If the system was as bad as the few egregious examples he offered, this country would be a complete mess. So what we have is a government driving an agenda on the RMA, which has every risk of blowing away all the really good stuff on the RMA and only doing a small thing to improve some of the systems in there. So that's kind of the sort of stuff going on with government. This is where we fit in with the world. This is a very big um, long-term study by Harvard and MIT together about the complexity of economies. And um, the um, higher the complexity, the darker, the redder the color. Um, and so we are a slightly more complex country than our neighbor. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're slipping um, quite substantially. Um, and back in 2012, our economy was as complex as Greece was, but better managed, um, and, um, which helps. And um, so if you kind of look at what we do, that's very heavily dependent on those low-value commodities. That's what a high-value economy looks like. Um, don't worry, there is a PDF I'll leave behind, and you can see all the small print. So what's the cure? Um, Lord Stern and others um, produced uh, through the new Global Commission on Economy and Climate in September last year this report um, about how we substantially change urban forms, um, energy uses, transport, this wonderful cornucopia of opportunities um, for the world in order to have um, a better climate and a better economy. 
And I won't dwell on the details here, um, but there is very important comparisons between um, investment in a high carbon urban form in terms of land use and energy sources and transport uh, versus a low carbon. And um, the capital cost of uh, low carbon is slightly higher, but the lifetime costs, thanks to lower running costs and the rest, is substantially lower. So this is here and now. Um, this is what we can do. And to me, it's really important in urban form about how we not only achieve this sort of change, but also we bring nature into our cities in a very powerful way. Um, so we don't divorce ourselves from nature. And so I think in one of, uh, and we use nature, we grow more stuff in our cities, for example. Um, and um, I think that's a fantastic opportunity to define urban form in New Zealand, for example, in such a distinctive way. So here comes the conditioning for the mind. This is this one of my favorite quotes from Lewis Mumford, the US critic from the 30s through to the 70s. Um, the city is a, is a fact of nature, like a cave or a run of mackerel or an ant heap. But it is also a conscious work of art, and it holds within its communal framework many simpler and more personal forms of art. Mind takes form in the city, and in turn, urban form conditions mind. I like that because if we are going to live a life something of the mind and an economy something of the mind, um, what we do with our cities does condition that. Um, and we see that around the world. Um, cities, um, it's this wonderful paradox about cities uh, reflecting um, their attributes, their uh, success of the past, but also shaping their future. And indeed, this is a, a different Mumford book about the city and history. Um, at the Art Institute in Chicago from late last year to early this, there was this wonderful exhibition about the city lost and found, and it looked at New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles with seminal events in each three cities in the 60s um, and what then transpired over, current, uh, over four subsequent decades, and I had a chance to uh, visit in January. Um, and um, so the Chicago one was the Democratic nomination convention in 1968 and the riots. Um, and it's a complex story about how Chicago now looks like this. One of my favorite things is the um, kidney bean over there on the far left. It's actually my screensaver on my laptop. Um, and um, so Chicago has expression of its great economic power, um, but um, a d quite a different sensibility as well. The New York story is very different. It focused on the time in the mid-60s when Lindsay just became mayor and finally managed to ditch all the Robert Moses plans for things like expressways carved through the heart of Manhattan across, the island, across Manhattan. Um, but it's, and Jane Jacobs and others was doing fantastic work trying to help communities give expression to what they wanted in their city. Um, and um, we finally get you know, bike lanes in um, New York. It's quite exciting. Um, and this is the story, extraordinary story of Los Angeles. Um, this was Bunker Hill in the very um, controversial uh, clearing of that, of those old uh, buildings on the hill in the uh, late 60s. And the time it's taken, it will be 50 years um, before we get this kind of transformation. And um, the end of the trip, I was in Los Angeles too, and had the great privilege uh, and pleasure to go to uh, the Disney uh, concert hall there, another fine, Geary Building, um, and um, um, it's um, a stunning place for concerts. Architecturally, this is challenging because these are expensive things to do and we don't have the money, um, but I'm a great believer that if we think hard about these things and are creative about them, we can achieve fantastic outcomes in New Zealand, uh, giving New Zealand expression to things like this um, in a rather more cost-effective way. Here's one of my favorite blueprints of the years to come. This is Vision 2050, done a couple of years ago by some of our um, great le young leaders in the country. And it's about New Zealand by 2050 being a country of six million people uh, living very well, uh, yet within um, the limits um, of our wonderful land and air and water. And so I urge you to have a look at this because this is a great schematic looking at those issues um, sector by sector. 
We also know how to do some of this stuff, um, and so this, for example, is from the New Zealand Institute a few years ago about um, how Denmark uh, did an economic transformation like the one we're trying to do and how it pulled it off. And, and so those are our exports in 2009 on the left, very similar composition to Denmark, um, but you can see how much bigger the scale of Denmark has achieved over that time. And again, you can think of um, how urban form, mind and the conditioning of it works in Denmark around trying to bring about that kind of transformation. So how might we apply this in New Zealand? Let me offer um, two very brief rural stories. Comvita is the only primary sector company that has fantastically transformed itself over the last 10 years by building a completely separate value chain to market um, for its uh, Monica Honey products. Um, right to stores within stores, it owns 600 of them across China and Asia. But it's also about the science. So um, when you get to use Monica honey scientifically proven in wound dressings to treat um, severe burns or um, infections, um, the value of that honey, it's untreated, it's just very carefully prepared, is 55 times that of boring old clover honey in a supermarket no-name pot. Um, so that's about where one mind takes you when you build completely different value chains. Separate example, um, this is the Yalen's uh, winery. It's the largest single uh, uh, area vineyard in the country in Seddon, top of the South Island. And this is the very wonderful um, uh, wine making facility. Um, but it's not just about a glorious um, industrial building. Um, it's about the extraordinary innovation that um, um, Yalen's get up to in sustainability matters. So if we're, this for me is again an, uh, an example of using that sort of um, conditioning of the mind, if you like, um, to think very differently about how you're going to do something and giving um, physical expression to it. And that's what you do as architects. I'll offer you a challenge. We're moving faster and faster towards herd homes, i.e. housing our cows in New Zealand in free stall buildings. At the moment, they are incredibly ugly, um, but we are dotting them, and they will be quite profuse across the landscape. There is a terrific um, public service, and I hope great business opportunity for somebody to do, to design a really beautiful herd home, perhaps different ones that fit in in quite different locales, and yet are still inexpensive and still do the job that will help the farmers um, house their cows better. What about urban? Um, this is an extraordinarily beautiful city. This is a, a painting from um, the um, early 1840s, just after the founding of Auckland in September 1840. And we've done a kind of an interesting job so far. We also have big ambitions. So this is the Auckland Council's economic strategy about um, e economic growth of 5% a year, double the current rate, export growth of 6% a year, which is about three times the current rate, and productivity growth of about 2% a year over the next 30 years. Um, and uh, actually, we're doing better on productivity. Uh, Brett O'Reilly, who runs the Economic Development Agency, told me the other day that he thought that uh, improvements in urban form in Auckland and transport were already having an impact on a very big productivity gain. So we're already starting to see the extraordinarily effective work um, by the council and others um, over the last four or five years um, to have this sort of impact. So that's a very tangible outcome um, of good um, uh, form and design. Um, Urban life is also about extraordinary companies like Xero. Yes, of course, it's Wellington-based. There's some stuff happens here too, but I'm not being proprietorial. It's just that Wellington needs an awful lot more like that because Wellington um, is adrift economically and in other ways. Um, and, um, but Xero is a very good example of conditioning the mind in an interesting way to take a fabulous um, product, a very radical one, um, out to... Um, the world and at face value a very prosaic um, product in the form of accounting software. Thinking about what I might say today, I've been wandering around the city over the last few days taking photos. Um, and these aren't about big places that we're really working on like the waterfront or you know, QE2 Square or whatever. Those are really important. 
but what sort of ideas uh, what might we carry through um, to help enliven and inform what we do on those uh, very big projects. And I just love the bit down from St. Patrick's Cathedral down Federal Street in that lovely little garden. Um, and uh, I love what's happened on High Street, um, in, and we managed to keep some of the suffragette, very strange Monty Python-esque um, tiles there, um, but open that up um, to give us a, a wonderful way to and view of um, our sensationally beautiful um, art gallery. Um, Freiburg Place is, um, again, one of my favorite places um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, not the least of which, how's that for an urban picture? How we do infrastructure is terribly important, too. Uh, you might remember the big fight with State Highway 20. Uh, NZTA wanted to sort of basically blast the side off Mount Roskill Cone, um, but the Cone Society and, and Richard Reed did a wonderful job had to go to court to do it and um, to get NZTA to move it slightly and therefore be able to um, uh, sensibly shape the volcanic cone to accommodate both the motorway on a great graceful curve um, but bring a lot of um, uh, Maori gardens elements to the treatment of that um, and um, a cycle path across it too. This is Hobsonville. Um, that's not all built yet. This is what they think might be built there. Um, but again, that's one of our better examples of um, trying to think about how we might do housing and urban development differently. Um, down in Glen Innes, close to where I live, um, this has happened very recently. This is from the Creating Communities Consortium led by Arrow and Hopper Developments and others um, about affordable housing built very fast. I was I'm down, up and down Aparana Avenue a lot, and I was very surprised about how fast these went up. And I've loved walking around there recently, um, just getting a sense of that place. And a very different project is this one, um, Declaration of Interest. My wife and I have a down payment on a townhouse in this. So I didn't mean to say that, so, uh, so to uh, voce. Um, but um, as you see, there's the Oraki Basin, there's the rail line coming out of town. There's an old gin factory there, amongst other things, uh, which um, Jazzmax and Pip Cheshire are redeveloping. And that's the first phase, and um, in due course, um, it looks like that. This is um, why my wife and I are very interested in this. It's um, a, a very good example, I think, of what um, density done very well looks like um, and, and starts to give expression of these sorts of issues in a very um, New Zealand way. And so what do we get for half a billion dollars um, when we want to build a convention center? I, I won't launch into my own views of how that needs to be a fabulous building that gives people a completely different convention experience than they get anywhere else, um, unlike mon monstrously big places elsewhere in the world. Um, um, but what worries me is that the people who run conventions are saying nothing about the plans and therefore whether they're good or not, and architects are saying very little about it too. And we, the public, desperately need you to give us a lot of ideas and analysis and thoughts about what's going on here. And I know it's difficult because three major firms are involved in this project. But if as a profession you can't, and we as a community can't have a conversation about these things, then we're completely stuffed. So please can we have a conversation about this and not leave it to the Prime Minister to decide uh, whether this should be done or not. And, um, um, and potentially it could deliver a lot of value. Um, but um, we need to ask ourselves, um, is it meeting those goals? And I don't know. I'm still struggling with this. And I would very much appreciate um, the chance to have some really insightful views on this um, because um, you know the before and afters are um, quite arresting. Yes, it's nice to keep the Albion Hotel, but not when it's squashed up against the convention center like that. So please could you join the conversation? Please could you start the conversation about this um, because it's quite an arresting building. So that's what we have to do in Auckland, in Tamaki Makoro, um, in the decades to come. 
It's a fabulous challenge because this is an extraordinary location for a city in natural terms. We've done an interesting job, that's a slightly loaded term, so far. Um, but we've done extraordinarily well over the last few years to make some real steps, small ones like shared spaces um, and the rest. It's, it's starting to happen. And it's got to because, to quote Johnny Rotten, you'll have no future if you don't make one for yourself. Thanks very much. Thank you.